Okay, so good morning and welcome to this session. As usual, uh, we have 15 minutes for each presentation and five minutes for comments and questions from the audience. Uh, I let the speakers know when there are five and two minutes left. And let's uh, start with the first speaker. Our first speaker is Javier Perote from Universidad de Salamanca. Uh, th thank you for, for coming to this presentation. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Ines Jiménez from the University of Salamanca and Andrés Mora Valencia from the University of uh, Los Andes. In this paper, uh, we uh, present a natural way to introduce the interaction between skewness and kurtosis and uh, we uh, show the uh, advantages of, of having uh, taking into account this, uh, this interaction in order to improve the, 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 risk, uh, the risk measures in, in financial uh, markets. I think it's, uh, it's quite a, a, an interesting result and, uh, and, and quite nice. No? Ac actually, the, the paper is, is already published in, in Finance Research Letters. Okay, le le uh, this is the outline of the speech. Uh, I will uh, start with a, a brief introduction, just trying to motivate the, the, the interest of, of taking into account the, this interaction between skewness and kurtosis. Afterwards, I, I will summarize very briefly the, the seminal parametric approach, and uh, I will present the, 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 the basic uh, risk measures that we are going to use to uh, uh, to show the, the, the performance of, of, of this, uh, this, uh, this modified grand Charlier density that uh, we are going to introduce in, in this paper. And afterwards, I, I, I will show the, the empirical application and, and, and finally I conclude. Let me start with just some pictures. This is the uh, daily uh, the histogram of the daily returns of uh, Standard & Poor's uh, 500. And it, it is uh, widely known that uh, this uh, uh, we, when we work with high frequency data, this data is uh, non Gaussian and they, they, uh, is, uh, the data uh, are uh, leptocurtic, uh, they have a, a, a sharp peak at the mean, and uh, especially they have uh, thick tails. But also, uh, they present usually uh, skewness uh, at, the, at the tails, and, 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 and usually the, the, the left tail is larger than, than, than the right, right tail. So, uh, it is true that um, the extreme values at, at the tails uh, have uh, an impact on uh, the skewness uh, of the distribution, but also uh, the skewness can capture uh, some part of the thick tails. So, we wonder if, if there is some interaction between uh, skewness and kurtosis, and if this interaction may have some uh, information content in order to improve the, the risk measures. Um, uh, we, uh, in this paper, we show that uh, the, uh, the seminon parametric approach uh, is a, a natural uh, framework in which we can take into account these uh, interactions between the moments. This approach uh, started in the early of the 20th century in statistics, but it was not introduced to econometrics uh, until the work of Sargan in the 70s. And afterwards, it, it has been implemented in, 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 in different uh, parts of uh, uh, financial uh, uh, modeling, uh, from derivative pricing, density model, from a univariate and multivariate approach, uh, and, and of course, for, uh, in, in, in risk management. But uh, as far as we know, uh, uh, this is the first paper that takes into account the uh, interaction between the, the moments of, of of the underlying distribution, seminal parametric distribution. And this is precisely our uh, main contribution in this paper. Um, let me just uh, remind you uh, the, the seminal parametric approach. And uh, this approach uh, derives from the uh, Grand Charlier densities. And uh, it is true that uh, uh, any regular uh, frequency function can be expanded in terms of uh, the uh, standard Gaussian uh, probability density function uh, multiplied by some Hermite polynomials uh, that are these HS uh, functions 
uh, that are weighted by uh, some DS parameters that have a direct relation with the moments of the distributions. In particular, d1 uh, is the conditional mean, uh, d2 the conditional variance, d3 uh, captures skewness, d4 uh, kurtosis, and so on. The, the, the larger the parameter, the uh, higher moment uh, is capturing. Uh, this is an example of the first four Hermite polynomials. And what is important is that these Hermite polynomials uh, can be obtained just directly from the derivatives of the standard Gaussian uh, probability density function. And uh, as well, uh, this is, uh, these polynomials are, are orthogonal. They form an, an orthogonal uh, uh, basis. And uh, this um, ensures uh, this, this, this nice property uh, makes uh, the density to integrate out to 1, but also uh, it makes uh, that uh, when we have a, an asymptotic expansion, this should, should be a k. Uh, when k goes to infinity, this grand Charlier expansion uh, uh, is uh, able to capture any uh, regular frequency function. In this paper, we modify this standard uh, grand Charlier distribution by adding all these terms that are uh, just the uh, cross products between the Hermite polynomials multiplied by some terms, this dij. Uh, these uh, parameters are uh, capturing. We argue that this, these parameters should be capturing the interaction between the moments. And what happens if we introduce this, all this new uh, part to the uh, semi-non parametric density? Theoretically, uh, the, the, the density uh, still integrates one, so just because uh, or, or in virtue of uh, the orthogonality of the Hermite polynomials, in virtue of this property. But what is interesting, if, if, the, if, if this have some impact or some information content uh, in terms of the uh, risk measures that we are obtaining from this approach. Okay, uh, just to uh, show uh, this issue, uh, if, if, if there is some information content on, on these um, cross parameters, let me just uh, take the, the, the simplest case, the case that is uh, the, the most uh, used in, in financial applications, in which the uh, grand salary distribution is expanded just up to the fourth term. And uh, uh, just for considering the standard case, we are uh, uh, imposing that d1 and d2 are zero, so these uh, densities uh, have zero mean and, and unit variance. So uh, afterwards, we are going to make transformations to introduce conditional uh, autoregressive and guards processes for uh, modeling conditional mean and variance of, of, the, of, the, of the variable. So in this case, this is the standard uh, grand Charlie expansion. Uh, where D3 uh, is capturing uh, skewness and D4 uh, is capturing excess kurtosis. And this is our uh, proposal, the modified Grand Charlier, where we are introducing this uh, interaction term between uh, that, we argue that is capturing the interaction between skewness and kurtosis. Mm. Okay, uh, in order to show the performance of, of, of this uh, new density, uh, uh, we are going to compare it in terms of the risk, different risk measures. The, 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 the most usual is the, the value at risk, of, of course. That is just a quantile of the distribution. Uh, and in this case, uh, one uh, advantage of, 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 of this semi non parametric approach is that the, um, the tails do not necessarily smooth decreasingly and they uh, make. Uh, half jumps at the tails, just uh, capturing the different probabilistic mass. And that's why, with this approach, we are uh, computing properly the, the corresponding quantile for every risk measure. And in this case, we are considering the right tail just because we are modeling, in the example, uh, the losses of the distribution, the, the, the negative returns. And uh, we are going to uh, use uh, as well uh, the median shortfall. That is, uh, it's an analogous uh, measure as expected shortfall or tail bar. Um, but considering the median instead of the average of the, of the, of the tail of the distribution. So uh, following Cohen Peng, this uh, median shortfall uh, can be uh, computed just as, as a bar. In particularly, 
uh, uh, we can use this formula and for example uh, 99 million shortfall is the same as 99.5 uh, bar this uh, median shortfall is more a more robust m uh, measure of, of risk when we have uh, an, an abundant presence of uh, outliers in the distribution okay we are going to compare this uh, the performance of our density compared to the traditional grand charlier uh, along a backtesting procedure for uh, both uh, risk measures and these are the, the two uh, distributions and uh, we are uh, taking a, a, a rolling window estimation of uh, 1000 observations I think and uh, we are going to compute for every uh, period along the testing window we are going to compute the forecast for the conditional mean for the conditional variance and as well for the co corresponding quantile uh, for every uh, risk measure uh, this is uh, an example of, of, of the in-sample estimates that will turn just for, for one of the period along the back, back testing for the first period. Uh, comparing different specific, uh, different grand charlier densities with just one parameter, uh, skewness, kurtosis, the two parameters, skewness and kurtosis, and our modified grand charlier where we are introducing the uh, parameter D3, D34, uh, capturing uh, the uh, interaction between skewness and kurtosis. What is important in this table is that this parameter is highly significant and uh, as well uh, the uh, performance of, uh, of this distribution, this distribution outperforms the uh, other simpler ground charlier densities or traditional ground charlier densities uh, in terms of uh, accuracy measures, the Ike or, or the log likelihood value. These are, uh, this is an, uh, an example of, of the uh, data fits uh, that we are obtaining with, uh, with these distributions and uh, what is more important to show the uh, performance along the, the whole back testing we uh, compare uh, we, we compute the 1990 99% uh, uh, bar unexpected shortfall measures for different for all these different specifications and we compare them along uh, a battery of, of, of tests in particular, I'm, I'm just, just focusing on, on the first column of this table and uh, where is recorded the uh, number of exceptions that we obtain uh, along the backtesting. This number of exceptions are the, 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 the number of times where the uh, corresponding risk measure is uh, exceeded. That, under correct specification, should be the confidence levels, as, uh, of course. Uh, with the, the sample that we have, the uh, expected number of, of exceptions that we should theoretically have is 18 for a valued risk and 9 for the expected shortfall measure. And uh, what we have is that by introducing this interaction effect, this, uh, these uh, 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 exceedances are quite uh, close, even closer uh, uh, than, than the other specifications to the uh, theoretical values. And this happens uh, as well uh, uh, when uh, we use the, the median shortfall instead of uh, the, the value at risk. So uh, mm, this is uh, quite a good performance for, for our specification. Uh, this is the, the parameter dynamics along the, the backtesting, but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, going to uh, tell anything about this. And just going to the conclusions, uh, in this paper we uh, generalize the Grand Charlier distribution uh, by introducing interaction terms for the first time in the literature. Uh, from our theoretical point, viewpoint, uh, this new distribution um, has not uh, any problem, uh, different than the, 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 the usual uh, Grand Charlier expansion since it, it, it integrates one at, and it, uh, we argue, even may solve some of the uh, positivity problems of this distribution just because uh, there is a recent result that by adding more parameters to the distribution the uh, range in which this distribution is positive uh, is wider. Uh, and um, from an empirical perspective we have shown that this uh, 
uh, modified branch earlier by introducing these interactions, uh, these interaction uh, effects are uh, significant, are meaningful for uh, uh, affecting the, the risk measures that we consider in, in, in usually in, in, in finance. Uh, of course, the applications, you, we have just uh, showed the, the good performance of this distribution just by introducing a single parameter, just the interaction between skewness and kurtosis, that was the focus of this paper. But in general, uh, we uh, should may consider uh, any interaction between the moments of the distribution. Probably at the cost of mm, perhaps identification problems, but this is, is still to be analyzed and derived. Uh, and, and this is what I wanted to, to show, and thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you, Javier, for your presentation. It's time now for questions or comments. I have a question, uh, Javier. So you <laughs> you th say that the, the paper is already published, but I have a question. Have uh -huh. you uh, tested the robustness of the results uh, using other kind of other, other types of financial series? I mean, instead of an index, individual mm. assets, exchange rates, or actually, uh, we started uh, just uh, trying to show it with with cryptocurrency returns instead mm -hmm. of, uh, but. Uh, uh, only with with assets, with uh, with returns from uh, from assets and from mm -hmm. from stock indices, uh, we started with cryptocurrencies. But as we uh, pretend just to to, to write a note uh, for for this yeah. review, we we concentrate in the most uh, usual one. But uh, I think this is maybe it depends on the series. But for every series that has uh, thick tails and skewness uh, and. and uh, um, Th these interaction effects should be uh, uh, okay. better to, to improve the risk, risk measures. Yeah. So, thank you. No Th thank you very much. So, let's thank again. <laughs> so, the next speaker is uh, Marta Gomez Puig from Universitat de Barcelona. Yes, I will present this paper, which is entitled Consumer and Business Confidence Connectedness in the Euro Area, a Tale of Two Crises. This paper is co-authored with Adrián Fernández Pérez and Simón Sosvía Rivero. This is the outline of the presentation. It's pretty standard. First, I will present the motivation, the objectives. This is an empirical paper, so we present the data, the econometric methodology, and then I will move to the main empirical results and concluding remarks. Regarding the motivation, in 2020, a decade after the global financial crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic and the grid lockdown caused the global recession worldwide. Concretely, uh, global and euro area activity resisted uh, an estimated 3.1% and 6.4% contraction, making the grid lockdown the worst recession since the Great Depression, and even worse than the global financial crisis. However, this data are known today, more than two years after the beginning of the pandemic, since the gross domestic product, the GDP, as uh, Ignacio mentioned before in the previous <laughs> session, not only is calculated annually or quarterly, but is also subject to multiple revisions, causing a large uh, loss of more specific information. However, as early as April 2020, we knew that both the consumer and business confidence indicators in the euro area crashed. So confidence indicators are very useful, and not only because of their fast availability, they are mm, published monthly, but they are also important for at least two other reasons. <coughs> First, they are a part of the leading indicators that are used to predict future financial and economic uh, trends. And second, the role of sentiments in explaining economic fluctuations has been highlighted by many authors in the literature, both from a theoretical and an empirical um, perspective. For instance, we can mention the paper by Keynes, 1936, where he links sentiment to the state of the long-term expectations, and his interpretation is usually referred to as animal spirits. So uh, the global financial crisis, and its sequel in Europe, which was the European Solidarity Crisis, and the COVID-19 crisis have brought these ideas back onto the agenda as they appear to be fraught with uh, elements that can be related or linked to sentiment. 
Clearly, if economic sentiment declines or falters, the first adjustment that consumers typically make is to slow down spending. Then investors will shift, would shift from risky to less risky assets. Firms may stop hiring and postpone capital investment, and output finally will fall and employment rise. But in turn, as economic assets become more aware of economic downturn, they are likely to revise down the economic sentiments and adding momentum to the, to the slowdown. So the linkage between uh, consumer and business confidence is clear since one fits onto the other. But while there is a broad literature that has analyzed this interlinkage in the United States, the interaction between consumer and business confidence indicators is still an understudied phenomenon in Euro area countries. So in this context, the objective of this paper is threefold. First, we aim to determine whether changes in confidence in the evolution of the economic activity are due to variations or changes in consumer or business perspectives, and to study whether the driver changes across Euro area countries. Second, we will try to measure spillovers between consumers and business confidence indicators among groups or <coughs> of variables or blocks. In our case, we will, our sample encompasses Euro area countries, so the blocks will be uh, central and peripheral countries. And finally, we will uh, analyze the time varying relationship between the two indicators to identify whether the transmitters and receivers of confidence shocks may change over time. And we will pay special attention to the behavior of economic sentiment during the global financial crisis and sovereign debt crisis and the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, and actually, the fact that the sample period, the sample period goes from November 1987 up to uh, February 2022, includes the two most relevant economic crises suffered by Euro area countries during the 21st century up to the present, allows us to analyze whether confidence behavior in times of crisis differs depending on the origin of the crisis. And in this sense, according to the literature, while the global financial crisis, like most financial crises, had its origin in a negative shock to demand, see for instance the paper by Ben Gurria and Taylor, 2020, the COVID-19 induced crisis is a combination of a supply and a demand shock. It had its origin first in a supply shock, but it very quickly shifted to a demand shock. See for instance Baldwin and Weather de Mauro, 2020. So regarding the data, the, in this paper we use the OECD confidence indicators. Concretely, the consumer confidence indicator provides information on future developments of households, consumption and savings, and the business confidence indicator provides information on future developments of on companies. Both of indicators are built up based on upon opinion surveys. The data set spans from November 18, 1987 to February 2022, they are monthly observations, and it includes 11 Euro area countries, six central countries and five peripheral economies. In these figures, it's uh, displayed the evolution of both uh, confidence indicators, consumer confidence indicators in the left, business confidence indicators in the right, for the 11 countries in the sample and throughout all the sample. At first glance, you can observe that there is a high correlation across uh, these confidence indicators. So regarding the methodology, we first use the general approach uh, of to, um, to capture connectedness, the Dibble and Gilmouth uh, connectedness approach, to measure and assess the movements of consumer and business indicators in a network. <laughs> Secondly, we will use a generalization of this connectedness framework or approach Concretely, we'll use Greenwood and Nimmo and Kauthus approach, which provides uh, a way to measure spillovers among uh, groups of variables or blocks. Our intention is to analyze uh, connectedness between central and peripheral countries. And finally, to assess whether connectedness is time varying, we'll follow Anton Nakakis and Gabor, 2020, who extend the dynamic connectedness literature by applying the time varying parameter bar approach. And I will move to the main results. First, I will show the results from uh, the static analysis for the full sample. 
they are presented in this large table, table number one. We present full, the full sample static connectedness among all the uh, confidence indicators, the 11 consumer confidence indicators and the 11 business confidence indicators. The diagonal elements mm, show the, the unconnectedness, so they present large values. But what's interesting is the, the directional connectedness <laughs> that each indicator receives from other indicators, which is presented in the last column, and the directional connectedness that each indicator transmits to other indicators, which is <coughs> presented in the next to last uh, row, these values are, are always higher than the own connectedness, meaning that there is a high degree of interconnection between both uh, uh, indicators of confidence in Euro area countries. Total connectedness presents also a very high value, over 74%. And if you look at the net contribution in the last row, which presents the directional uh, transmitted to other indicators minus the directional connectedness received from other indicators, the higher value corresponds to the Germany business confidence indicators the lowest value corresponds to Ireland business confidence indicators. These results suggest that these two indicators are identified as the most important net transmitters and receivers of confidence shocks, respectively, highlighting the position of Germany as the most important economy in the euro area, while Ireland is a strong receiver of confidence from other euro area countries. As a complement of the analysis presented in the first table, Table 2 reports the static connectedness by blocks of countries. So from this table, what's interesting is that net pairwise block connectedness from central to peripheral countries, in the case of the consumer confidence indicator, is very, is very low, is merely 2.6%. This would be the result of 18.74%, which is the connectedness from central to peripheral countries, in the case of consumer confidence indicator, minus 16.08, which is, would be the connectedness from peripheral to central countries. That result suggests that there is not a clear trigger of receiver of confidence shocks within consumer confidence indicators of these two regions of countries. But in stark contrast, the net pairwise block connectedness from central to peripheral countries in the case of, of business confidence indicators is 14.30%, suggesting that in the case of business confidence, Central countries are a strong trigger of confidence shocks to peripheral countries. So, as indicated, we use the TVD par approach to carry out the dynamic connectedness analysis to assess how connectedness evolves over time. Figure number two displays the dynamic net connectedness from central to peripheral countries. In the case of consumer confidence indicator in the panel A and business confidence indicator in panel B. Beginning with business confidence indicator, uh, we can see that uh, this dynamic net connectedness from central to peripheral countries is always positive, meaning that throughout all the sample, um, central countries, as we see, uh, have just seen before in table two, are the main uh, triggers of confidence. Confidence in the case of business. Uh, confidence indicators is uh, transmitted from central to peripheral countries. But in the case of consumer confidence indicators, this value in some subsamples is positive, meaning that central countries are the triggers, and in some subsamples uh, is negative, meaning that peripheral countries are the ones who are the, the triggers. And then to gain a deeper understanding of how the propagation of confidence works for each country in, the, in our sample, table number three, offers a summary of the behavior of net connectedness for each country during two different crises. In panel A, we uh, summarize the results from the, for the global financial crisis and European sovereign debt crisis that goes from August 2007 till July 2012. And panel B corresponds to the COVID-19 pandemic and goes from March 2020 till February 2022. Well, results in this table clearly indicate the net connectedness of both indicators are time-varying. 
So panel A corresponds to the global financial crisis and European debt crisis, panel B to COVID-19 crisis. In both cases, we show the net connectedness from each of the 11 consumer confidence indicators and each of the 11 business uh, confidence indicators. Positive values indicate that the corresponding indicator is a net transmitter and are highlighted in green. Negative values indicate that the corresponding indicator is a net receiver and are highlighted in red. So uh, if you analyze the behavior of consumer confidence indicators, we can see that during the global financial crisis, they uh, mainly affect uh, consumer confidence of peripheral countries. This is true for all the countries with the exception of Greece and Ireland. However, the role of <coughs> consumer confidence indicators increases during the COVID-19 crisis. It not only, they not only influence confidence, uh, consumer confidence of peripheral countries, but also consumer confidence of central countries and business confidence of peripheral countries. So we can observe an increase in the role of consumer confidence in the COVID-19 crisis compared to the role they had in the global financial crisis. I'm going to the role played by the business confidence indicators, we can observe that it's pretty similar in both crises. All in all, these results suggest that while the evolution of business confidence has a higher role compared to the role of uh, consumer confidence during the first crisis, the role of consumer confidence increases in the COVID-19 crisis, catching up that of business confidence. As I said before, the fact that the origin of the two crises is different might explain the results. And following the literature, see for instance Ben Gurion Taylor, <coughs> 2020, the global financial crisis, such as the mm, majority of financial crises, has <coughs> its origin on a demand shock. <coughs> in that context, <coughs> we can infer that as households slow down spending, that causes a fall in business confidence, then uh, that causes a postponement of investment decisions and as output uh, falls and unemployment rises, consumer confidence also declines. A completely different story uh, happened during the COVID-19 crisis, which is a combination of a supply and a demand shock. First, the sudden stop in economic activity caused the supply shock. Public health authorities preventing service workers from doing their jobs can be thought as a shock of this kind, a supply shock. And first affected unemployment, since many service workers lose uh, their jobs. Therefore, consumer confidence declined, since household has to reconsider their consumption decisions. But that decrease in consumption, joined with the fact that people are staying at home because of the, the uh, lockdown and not going to restaurants or movie theaters, also implied a demand shock and therefore a fall in business confidence. So the COVID-19 crisis can be considered as a combination of both supply and demand shocks. And our results may be an indication that economic sentiment behavior in times of crisis might differ depending on the origin of the crisis. It may first affect business confidence when the crisis has its origin in a demand shock, such as the global financial crisis, while both consumer and business confidence might lead the economic sentiment's behavior if the origin of the crisis combines elements of both demand and supply shocks, such as the COVID-19 crisis. And just to finish, I will show the dynamic net pairwise directional connectedness between these two crisis episodes. On the left, panel A, the global financial and European debt crisis, panel B, the COVID-19 crisis. At first glance, we can observe an increase in the connectedness relationships in the COVID-19 crisis compared to the global financial crisis, which suggests a more vigorous network of relationship between the confidence indicators in the latter crisis. Moreover, panel A that corresponds to the global financial crisis shows that most of the connectedness relationships, 71, if we only consider the most intensive ones, those in black, which correspond to the 10th percentile, 71 of them uh, depart from business confidence indicators. However, in the COVID-19 crisis, 
if we only look at the most intensive relationships, about two thirds of them, 65%, depart from consumer confidence indicators. So while the main trigger in, during the global financial crisis is business confidence indicators, there is an increase in the role of consumer confidence indicators in the COVID-19 crisis. And just to finish, a very interesting result is that the main triggers of the strongest connectedness relationships departing from consumer confidence indicators during the COVID-19 crisis are, as we can see in this figure, Portugal, Spain, France, and Finland. And these four countries, with the exception of Finland, registered a high stringency index during the pandemic, according to Heil and Klaus 2022. This index, developed by the Oxford COVID-19 Government Response Tracker, includes containment and closure policies during the pandemic, and the higher the index, the stricter the measures. So this was, these uh, results suggest that the countries that had the stricter uh, closure policies, such as uh, Portugal, France, and Spain, uh, resisted a uh, higher decline in its consumer confidence that was transmitted to the rest of the countries. In contrast, the country whose uh, consumer confidence indicator is more influenced by the rest is Belgium, a country with a, a low stringency index. We can see that, that in the figure, Belgium is a net receiver of confidence from the rest of the indicators in the network. And I think that I have to finish, no? Lena, you have a lot of time? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I will skip the, the, the concluding remarks. Well, well, when you have I can, yeah, I can summarize. We can leave the questions then for the break. So okay, you can, you can okay. <laughs> so we examine the interconnection between consumer and business confidence indicators in 11 euro area economies with monthly data that cover the pay period November 1987, February 2022. And to the end, we apply first the static connectedness framework uh, proposed by Devold Gimel 2000. Uh, um, 14. Secondly, a generalization of that methodology developed by Greenwood, Nemo, and Klausos to capture connectedness with central and peripheral countries. And finally, the dynamic connectedness methodology proposed by Anton Anakis and Klausos 2020. Our results suggest that both consumer and business confidence indicators are highly interconnected. On average, central countries' business confidence indicators are the main net transmitters, while peripheral countries' <coughs> business confidence indicators are the main net receivers of confidence shocks. Instead, there is not a clear trigger or receiver of confidence shocks among central and peripheral countries' uh, consumer confidence indicators. When analyzing the two major um, economic crises of this century, uh, up to February 2022, our results indicate the devolution of the business confidence indicator had a higher role during the global financial crisis and debt crisis, but the role of consumer confidence increases during the COVID-19 crisis, catching up that of business. Our results may be an indication that economic sentiment behavior in times of crisis might differ depending on the origin of the crisis. They suggest that business confidence reacts first when the crisis has its origin in a demand shock, such as the global financial and debt crisis, while during the COVID-19 crisis, which is a combination of a supply and demand shock, then economic sentiment decline might be caused by the drop of both economic agents' confidence, business and consumers. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marta, for your presentation. <laughs> so we are around now of time, so if you don't mind, if you have questions, you can address Marta during the break. Yeah. So, yeah, it's okay? Or you have a very quick question? No? I know that you have analyzed things looking at sectors also. No. Or not yet? Not yet. We had the idea to do that. But this paper is so so large that at the end you have to split it. And but why I well, mean why our intention is to do that by sectors, but it's not done yet. And and uh, by doing this by countries first, did you get some idea about what you would expect in sectors or uh, so so did you get some insight? Because you, you really got this uh, very nice result about the central countries versus the peripheral, peripheral countries. And I guess there is also some correlations in the sectors there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, yeah. I mean, uh, it's in, uh, on, in our agenda, but it's not done yet. 
because the paper, uh, as it is right now, is, is a very large paper. So we have to, to split it into papers. So in the second papers, our intention is to do it by sectors, but it's not uh, But I mean, you, I, I know the reason why you asked me that to me, because in our proposal, we write down, wrote down that we are, we're going to do it by sectors too. So thank you again, Marta. The next speaker is uh, Juan Vega Paquero from Universidad de Barcelona. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me in this conference. Uh, this is part of my PhD thesis. Uh, I work together with my supervisor, uh, Dr. Miguel Santolino. Uh, yeah, and I will just uh, go through the what is the meal. I will explain you afterwards. So we'll go through the motivation and what the reason we are making the study. Then we, I will explain you what the MILA is. Afterwards, we will see the methodology and the results that we have gotten so far. And finally, we will get uh, some concluding remarks. <coughs> so basically, uh, why are we studying this? Uh, in 1980, uh, Felsen and Horioka, they made a study through 21 OECD countries trying to assess whether the liberalization of capital markets led to a movement of capitals, uh, to capital flows uh, between these countries. They did it by um, assessing the savings and investment uh, rates in the, in the countries. And they just noticed that there is a high correlation between savings and investment in all these 21 countries that they were studying. So their conclusion was that since the correlation is so high, there were no movements of capital between the countries because, because all the capital that was being saved was reinvested in the same country. Uh, afterwards, in 2017, uh, Ford and Horioka explained that a uh, uh, good reason for this could be that the capital market liberalization is not enough to produce uh, capital movements, but uh, there is also need for liber liberalization in other uh, markets, such as labor market and good markets. Uh, so starting from this, uh, we will try to assess in a very specific setting uh, whether this uh, hypothesis holds or not. So basically, we'll check the Latin American integrated market, <coughs> which is uh, an integrated market between four uh, stock markets from uh, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. And we will try to see whether the integration of these countries uh, led to a movement of capital between them between them. And then how are we going to do it? We'll go through two main approaches. Firstly, uh, we'll see um, a time series analysis, and then we'll go through a cross-sectional analysis. So uh, this is a graph of the Mila market. So basically, uh, what you see here is the market capitalization of the four markets. Uh, I don't know if maybe you can see here the white line. So the, fir the first part uh, on the left is uh, when all the markets were operating separately. And then in June 2011, uh, we got the union of the first three markets, which were uh, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. And then finally, in December 2014, which is the second white line that you can see here, uh, it was <coughs> the moment of the union uh, with Mexico. So basically, this is the current situation of the Milan. We are trying to see whether the, there were movements between the uh, <coughs> between the stock market uh, that ha has to have something to do with these uh, dates that we are trying to study. How are we going to do this? Basically, uh, we are trying to see, uh, we are going through uh, composition analysis. We are trying to see if the composition, the participation of each of these stock markets within the total is changing uh, after this, uh, the entrance in force of the agreement in these two different dates. So basically, we are trying to see if this participations here are different than here and different than here. This is more or less what we are trying to do. Uh, so basically what we are going to do uh, is use compositional data since we are only interested in the participation of each of these countries within the total of the Mila market. Uh, so basically what is a composition? A composition is a multivariate series in which we are not interested in the value itself, but in the participation of each of the parts within the total. So basically, this is defined by a vector uh, uh, y1 to yn, in where 
in which each um, is a each uh, value is a non-negative value, and they add up to a constant, usually one. And this is the, the space vector who, which describes compositional data. Then, uh, in order to work with this kind of data, uh, H. Chison, who is like the lead of this uh, framework, <coughs> basically he uh, defined what is the definition of the sample of the sample space, and the um, uh, through the uh, powering and perturbation operations, and then he finally made the compositional mean H. Chison distance that we will afterwards and the transformations that will allow us to use um, regular statistical methods. Because as you can imagine, having data which is uh, between 0 and 1 and that it's constrained to add up to a constant has restrictions in terms of statistics. So basically, after we apply C CLR and ILR transformations, we are able to use uh, distributions that are uh, defined in the real space and not only in the 0, 1 space. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, first we'll try to go uh, through the time series analysis. So we'll try to see uh, whether <coughs> first modeling our series through vector autoregressive models, uh, we'll try to see whether the coefficients change uh, before and after the entrance, the entrance in force of the agreement. And then we'll try to do it first through the, uh, the series of the market capitalization, and then we'll try to go through the compositional analysis mm, by making use of the ILR transformation. And yeah, these are basically the models that we estimated after the <coughs> checking uh, which number of lags is the best. So here, basically, we use 12 lags, which corresponds to the annual um, uh, annual uh, data. Uh, we have monthly data from 2005 to uh, 2020. Uh, yeah, and uh, for the compositional model, we only need one lag to, to model data. But basically, when we do this uh, through multivariate time series, we realize that the coefficients are not significant. So basically, the, it is not possible to find a relationship between the <coughs> current value of either the capitalization or, or the transform compositional series and the, the previous value. So basically, uh, what we conclude is that through uh, multivariate time series, we are not able to uh, test the hypothesis that we are trying to test. So we go back to the cross-sectional methods uh, applied to compositional series. So basically, uh, we use four different ones. Well, the first one is um, model, and the, the other three are just distant, distance measurements. Uh, so first, we'll try to see a Gaussian mixed model. Then we'll check the edges on distance that I mentioned before. Here, I will explain a bit more. Uh, a cosine similarity uh, index <coughs> and the compositional cool-back labor divergence. So uh, first, the results for the Gaussian mixed models. So basically what we are trying to do here is we assume that our data is generated by a mix of three different, of three Ga Gaussian distributions. And what we, have see, we ha what we have here is for every point, the model is telling us which of the three, composi of the three distributions is um, is followed by our, our point of data. So basically, all of these points of data are follow the second distribution, these follow the third, and these follow the first one. But what we can see is that even if we find two clear breaks, they do not correspond to uh, the points that we are trying to test. So if there is a difference in the composition of the market uh, at these points that we have, see, that we have here, uh, it does not correspond to the entrance in force of the agreement. So basically, what we are saying is that uh, we cannot find any evidence that there was a flow of capitals between the markets in the two points of, day, uh, of time that we are trying to test. Then we go to the edges on distance. So uh, here, what we are trying to see is the distance between one composition and the, the composition of the market in one period and the composition of the market in the period before. So basically, we are trying to see if the participations uh, of each of the markets change substantially. Uh, and we are trying to see if there is an important change, especially in this moment uh, when the Mila market uh, uh, starts to work. So basically, we can see that almost for all the period, um, 
the distances are very close to zero. And especially in the points that we are interested in, there is no significant change in the distance. So basically, the composition of the market uh, continues to be very similar to the one before. So there is no flow of capitals from one market to the other. Uh, here we have the cosine similarity results, which are basically uh, similar results. Uh, here in the cosine similarity, we are trying to test whether two vectors, in this case, the two vectors correspond to the participations of the markets. Uh, how different are they between one another? So again, we are testing the participation in one period uh, against the participation in the period before. And yeah, basically what we see this in this case, uh, <coughs> a value close to one means that there is a high similarity between the two vectors that I'm trying to test. And as you can see here, it is almost all the time very close to one, and especially in the periods that I'm trying to analyze. The uh, cosine similarity is very, very high, close to one. So the, again, the composition of the Mila market for the period and the period before are uh, essentially the same. And finally, uh, for the compositional callback labeler divergence, we have something similar <coughs> to the edges and distance. So basically, here we are trying to see uh, if there is a divergence between two vectors, two compositional vectors. This is an, an adapted version for this kind of data. And basically, uh, if they are close to zero, it means that they are very close one to another. And what we have here is that it is uh, close to zero for almost the whole period. And uh, particularly in the periods that we are interested in, the, the compositional Kohlberg labeler divergence is close to zero. So um, again, we cannot see any difference in the composition between uh, in the market uh, for um, be uh, before and after the entrance in force of the agreement. So uh, as a conclusion, we can see that uh, through the compositional methods, it was not possible to find any, ev any evidence that the, there was a, a recomposition in the capital in, in the <coughs> in the Mila market uh, that was uh, caused by the entrance in force of the agreement. Um, and we, uh, yeah, uh, well, okay, that's that's the last one, which basically uh, confirms what Felstein and Horioka said in the beginning that uh, capital market li liberalization is not enough to generate the capital uh, movements between markets, as uh, classical theory would suggest. More from the, uh, the methodological point of view, uh, the VAR models were not suitable to test our hypothesis. And then the, <coughs> the mixed models and the distance measurements that we, that we used uh, provide very results, uh, which confirms that uh, the compositional data framework has uh, strength in providing us uh, tools to uh, assess certain hypotheses that we might be interested in. And then what uh, is to do next? Uh, we can try other types of modeling approaches. For example, there is an option to do, um, instead of Gaussian mixed models, we can use uh, Dirichlet mixed models, which are um, we can uh, think of, uh, since the Dirichlet distribution is more suitable, since it's also this, uh, it's defined between 0 and 1, and the data will fit more closely compositional data, we could try also to, to use a Dirichlet mix distribution. Um, and also uh, proportionality uh, uh, instead of correlation to, to solve a bit the problem that we have with the um, VAR models, that they did not find any any correlation. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Any questions or comments from the audience? No? I have a question, David. Yeah. Well, it's more than a question, it's a curiosity. Yep. Have you explored uh, which are the possible uh, barriers to higher integration? I mean, I'm thinking on transaction costs, liquidity of the market. Yeah, actually, that's the okay. Yeah, I, maybe I went a bit too f too fast through it. Actually, that's why our um, approach, like no, the the, the study case I is very specific and it's like very good for it, because the idea with this integration is that there are no costs in the tr in the transaction. So basically, if I am in Colombia, I can simply invest in Mexico as if I were investing in Colombia. So there are no transaction costs. And since this kind of investment is like very easy to to put and come back to to the to the investment, 
uh, we assume that, okay, if at this point I am allowed to invest in other countries, I will just look for better opportunities wherever I can find them. And if they did not do it, it's because the liberalization is not enough. Maybe there is something else that is missing to incentivize people to go and invest in the other countries. For example, are there markets for uh, heading products or something like that? Uh, well, not as much because the, the, the markets are still small and, well, one's more than the others. But, yeah, not still not that much. Okay. And oh, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, like, uh, your variable is uh, the market cap capitalization, the overall market capitalization, P times Q. Uh, I don't know if it's possible maybe to, to do the composition by sector. Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, ma maybe for example, uh, the the telecommunication sector uh, uh, of 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 the of the of the Mila, uh, the the shares of the te telecommunication sector of, of of the of the Mila companies, uh, maybe they 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 could have changed with the with the with the le legislation or or any other sector. I, I don't know. Uh, is there another way to to explore? Uh, this uh, uh, change in compositional data by sector or, or by, for example, insti institutional uh, investor or, or something else? Is there the data available? That's what I was about to say. Like, uh, we did not think about it uh, to go that deep because, yeah, of course, we have information restrictions. But of course, it could be like a very good exercise to see this differentiated by sector. So for example, it was not that uh, investment was going from Colombia to Mexico, but it was going from uh, infrastructure in Colombia to telecommunications in Mexico, like something more specific within a sector. That could be like a very good, good extension and, and a, a further exercise to this like in more specific data. But we do not have it available for now. More questions? No? Just one curiosity. Yep. Uh, regarding the data, I don't know, th I, I don't know if it's available, but uh, you use market capitalization. Maybe you could use, uh, for the time series analysis, uh, as you are looking at uh, capital flows, you could use another variable, such as, for example, uh, foreign direct investment or another variable related to flows between countries. Not yeah. Capital market uh, capitalization and yeah, well, it was like a bit the, the, the specific setting that we are trying to, to check mm -hmm. because, yeah, like if you go, yeah, then you can go also like for more macro level uh, variables, but then you also like we fall back in the results that Felsen and Horioka were, were falling because then since they are just checking for the macro, then we have still the excuse that, okay, but we can be uh, integrated in the capital markets, but we can, we are not integrated in other markets, in labor market or goods market. So this creates frictions. And then we go back to the explanation that they gave. And we were trying to see if there is something else. Because here, you cannot argue exactly that um, it's labor market. Because this investment is like very easy to make. I simply just buy and sell assets in, in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not restricted as a current account that you have to, like all the equations have to compensate from one side or the other. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank again David. <laughs> Our next expe speaker is, mm, I apologize for my, for my, my pronunciation, uh, Vigniew Krysiak, is, is correct? Is that correct? Okay, <laughs> from Skora from Varsovia. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a, a very important topic from practical perspective. Uh, currently, as you know, there's a many uh, going around, I mean, uh, related to uh, potentially change in the, uh, I mean, uh, trading uh, system. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a, basically, you know, 
according to the economical theory and the praxis, you know, if you, I mean, uh, uh, transfer the pollution to the environment, you have to pay for that, right? So more or less, you know, the price on the <coughs> European trading system should be, you know, related to that different damages for the environment. And uh, we currently uh, see that, you know, the uh, decline in the emission in the European Union, you know, of, uh, over 50 years uh, was about the 30 percent. And it seems to be if we pick up, uh, get this trend, so we can approach the zero emission after 100 years, not after the 30 years or 25 years, like, you know, many politicians optimistically are uh, approaching. <coughs> so, uh, you know, I, I'm trying, you know, to hesitate that issue from the investor perspective. So the company, which is charged with that, you know, tax for emission of CO2, this is a cost of the production of energy, right? So I for many companies, you know, this uh, uh, share in the cost of the production energy, the, eight, uh, the, the tax for a CO2 emission is sometimes even 60%. So this is a very big barrier. So this, of course, is transferred a little bit, you know, uh, to the customers, but not all of this. So if the uh, pro producers of uh, uh, energy, you know, have a very high cost and in that situation very low margin, then there is a lack of a capital for investment for uh, technologies uh, uh, for projects which are going to decline the uh, CO2 emissions. So this is a very important problem. So the question is <coughs> if that, you know, prices on the, um, I mean, a trading uh, system or, or that, say, uh, or kind of a stock, they are really reflecting, you know, the damages you, you do for the environment. So I'm saying no. The question is uh, there are many issues why there is not consistent and there is not basically related to these damages. As you see, you know, <coughs> the increase in the emission over the basically last uh, months, there's a huge, Im I mean, an increase here, you know, from basically uh, 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 October or November 2021. Uh, th th there is a question, you know, did the damages for the environment increase so much? No, of course not. So what are the, I mean, the reasons for that, uh, for that increase? And of course, this increase impacts, as I said, very much in the, the cost of the production of energy, okay? So <coughs> then, uh, you know, uh, we are asking, you know, the question, what approaches, what models, what tools, you know, the investors have to use to make sure their investments are going to be profitable, okay? Uh, if, if under the circumstances of that level of prices, they are going to be profitable. The question is what level of prices, you know, for a CO2 emission or tax, you know, are, I mean, acceptable to be challenged for such a, uh, investments. Uh, yeah, um, uh, there is as well, you know, m much uh, related to the regulations, so the certificates. You have a free allowance for the certificates, right? So there is unbalanced, you know, uh, approach in this process to deliver the free certificates against the, the prices on the market, right? And the question is as well, you know, reasons for abnormal CO2 prices. So there is a much talk about that, you know, there is, uh, I mean, a financial institution being a players, actors on that trading are just, you know, damaging basically the, or just uh, the speculative, you know, uh, activities uh, uh, distort the level of prices. So I'm saying, you know, from economical perspective, the financial institutions are not producing CO2, 
okay? If you do not produce, this is no, not your core business, right? So you don't understand how to uh, evaluate the cost of the production of the CO2, okay? So that's uh, the, I think, I think a fundamental problem. And, and there is much talk, you know, to revise that system, to remove the financial institutions from <coughs> that system at all. Um, yeah, the question is what tools, you know, to use. Uh, there is a, some uh, group or some proposals, you know, uh, for investors to be used uh, uh, when they are going to verify the profitability uh, uh, of the projects. The, the first thing, you know, is just to make sure that the return is appropriate. And as we see, you know, the, uh, I mean, uh, companies, uh, I mean, uh, investing in, uh, in the, in, uh, I mean, uh, environmental related uh, uh, projects, uh, they are very much in that profit table. Uh, the question is uh, about as well how to, I mean, uh, include in that models volatility, how to model that, uh, how, uh, I mean, how important is a real volatility distribution for purpose of Monte Carlo simulation. And finally, I am just going to the real option model as a proposal, you know, for <coughs> basically good tool uh, for that uh, purpose. So there is an, uh, a research we did, you know, for 50 ECG companies, so companies which are, I mean, uh, investing, you know, in the uh, uh, environment, you know, type of projects, and we compared them with uh, stock indexes all over the world, right? So the results are that you have, on average, you know, the return uh, a 50 percent on average over for this ECG companies over the uh, stock indexes. If you look into the uh, uh, risk, so as a standard deviation, uh, you, there is not a statistically significant difference, right? So this is a kind of evidence which says you, yes, this inv investment projects in the environment which is related to the, as well, this energy sector, CO2 emission, makes sense. So let's go ahead. And uh, we propose to use, you know, the Gatch model for getting an idea about the profile of the volatility so that afterwards, you know, to use that as a template for the real uh, distribution of the volatility as an input to the real option model. So uh, uh, this is a, a study which just, you know, results based on the uh, index in Leipzig uh, uh, of that uh, uh, CO2 prices. And uh, based on that, you know, there is a, a uh, distribution of the volatility, which uh, is a real distribution, right? So based on that, we create a generator. And this generator you use, you know, for, uh, as an input for real uh, option model. And then we go step ahead. This is again, you know, the research study which showed, you know, the accuracy. Under these circumstances, we used that previous uh, volatility distribution profile as input data. So you see <coughs> that backtesting of that real option model based on the, some sample of a companies, uh, this was based on the Warsaw Stock Exchange companies, uh, looks quite, you know, promising, you know. We basically invest in that different, you know, uh, energy in energy sector, we invest in the horizon of not rather two or three years, but longer, right? Period, horizon. So look, there is a, in that backtesting, you see these differences between the real value, right, on the market and the arriving from the model. So as you see 
in that horizon from basically four to eight years, you have a reasonable error. I mean, the difference is not a big one from the practical perspective. So we can say, yes, we are advising, you know, to use that as a very good tool, you know, for, for in investors. So <coughs> finally, you know, uh, the modeling of CO2 prices for the purpose of the profitable low carbon emission project appraisal is not the same as the CO2 prices for forecast. Okay, so what we say, you cannot, I mean, I use the forecast from the trend of a historical CO prices <coughs> as a something, you know, which uh, uh, you uh, assume as a base for your investment project. This what you forecast from, from that is kind of a information how far you are from the point which makes your, uh, in, which makes your uh, uh, project uh, profitable. So it means that if you are on that level on the uh, uh, tax uh, CO2 prices, right? and your level you can go with your project is here. So you have the message here, no, it's not the time for you. So what this can, I mean, what out of that can be the conclusion from regulators? You, you need to change something. Otherwise, you know, many investors, many companies are not willing, you know, to <coughs> put, money, put, put money in the investment projects uh, to decline the CO2 emission. So finally, there is as well attached the literature. We, I mean, uh, try to su support some certain, uh, our statements and hypotheses. And by the way, at the very end, you know, if we decline the CO2 emission up to zero, so the trees, flowers, need to eat that, right? <laughs> yeah, this is the question. You know, we, we need to remember where we are, how far. This is the ideology, of course. But, you know, the experts, we, we know, you know, some trees, flowers, you know, without CO2 cannot be alive, right? There is a uh, many research studies. And the other, I mean, a uh, point, I mean, a uh, <coughs> information, if you look in the share of a CO2 in the air, okay, over the last 100 years or 200 years, the share doesn't change. The share didn't change of CO2. So the question is, do we have too much? I if we would have too much, the share I in the structure of the air, so uh, should be different, right? So, so what, what happens with that, right? What, 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 what that means, right? That's, that's by the way, this is not the part of my, uh, of my presentation and research. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, speaker, for the presentation. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you, were, you were saying that the data comes from the EX in, in Leipzig, um, your, your prices of CO2. What, what prices do you use? Do you use spot prices? Are those futures? Are those it was spot, prices? spot prices. Spot prices. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the second uh, comment I have, you mentioned this in your motivation that you have speculators in the market, right? Um, for futures markets, at least, you, you need these speculators in the markets because they take the counter position of other participants in the market, at least to some extent. So if you look into the commitment of traders uh, reports for the futures markets, and that might be something that's relevant for your, for your paper here. If you look into the commitment of traders for CO2 futures, it looks quite different from other commodities. It, it's very clear that uh, you have those commercials that you're talking about here, they are in a risk reduction position net long, and you see that their position is almost entirely mirrored by uh, investment firms that are net short 
in a speculative position and then you have the you have others and you know investment funds in the middle somewhere that don't play a large role so that might be something that you you want to consider uh, in your motivation i i completely agree that investors they destabilize they or the the speculants might destabilize the price but you still need them in the market you can't just cut them out that's not going to work that doesn't work for any other market it won't work for co2 so um, le le let's say in that, so the, this, I mean, that the, the, the financial institutions are on that market, it was not my motivation. My motivation was, you know, how um, uh, equipped, you know, the investors, I mean, uh, companies who are producing energy with appropriate staff of uh, tools, uh, models to apprise the investment uh, project, right? So how they can approach, what they can use, you know? And uh, uh, the another issue is, you know, what is the role of this, uh, I mean, the uh, speculators, uh, financial institutions? You know, I think, you know, the speculators on the normal financial, I, I mean, a uh, stock uh, um, exchange stock where you, I mean, uh, trade the shares and other financial instruments, a different one, and we need them. Without speculators, you could not match, you know, both sides, you know, who are just hedging or, uh, and so on, right? So, so I agree. But, you know, here we have much different situation. So, I, uh, of course, there is, ca can be, I mean, a point to the discussion. But I think, you know, to evaluate the prices of a product, you know, uh, which is traded so that CO2 is a product, right? Who can do that evaluation in, in the right way? For sure, the producers of a CO2. So, so banks or financial institutions are not producing. They do not have uh, any idea, you know, how to uh, price uh, this as a cost of that day production. Or, I mean, uh, pr the cost of the production of the energy. And this is uh, something, you know, like, you know, uh, regulations in the uh, banking sector after the crisis. Before, there were banks which were allow allowed to have a 2% of a capital against the uh, credit portfolio. Afterwards, we see what? Some of them have to have a 20%. Okay, it means, I, I think this is, uh, we are around about in the same point where this kind of a, before crisis of the Basel II, everybody was happy, Basel II implemented, and right away the crisis appeared. One of the reasons was that, you know, some banks used this, that low allowed capital based on that uh, internal models as a speculation, because if they, you know, transferred that uh, mortgage portfolio to SPVs, the SPV had to had a 10% of the capital. Bank had a 2%. So we, we notice the speculation, right? So, so the question is uh, about the right pricing, the risk, you know, and right uh, appropriate uh, pricing the cost of a uh, emission of CO2. So I think if we start from the point, right, if this emission of CO2 is doing the damages in the environment, and we know what, uh, we, we can price these damages, so the equivalent uh, on that level, uh, left side should be the price of a, uh, of a CO2 or tax, or, uh, tax of CO2. So I think we need exactly like in the crisis of a 2008 to have an intervention of the regulators and more work done on that why, you know, you had huge, um, I mean, an increase. But there is not, I mean, a basic explanation. C could you explain that? What, why and what was the reason? So su such huge increase in the price of a CO2, I don't know. I cannot explain that. But anyway, I mean, you, you, you touched the right point, <coughs> but my main, our main objective in that research was to think from the perspective of investors. So that to a little bit support them with appropriate approach tools 
and not to rely on that what they are getting from 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 outside only. If you if you if you look for or if you're looking into these these decisions of projects, it might also be a good idea to to look into futures prices of CO2 because usually they're they're years ahead these projects and if you work with the spot price now you know, and, and since you need them, the, the, the December contracts of those futures are always those. With I fully agree with you, yes. I, I fully agree and I support, yes. Anyway, I, I mean, uh, we, we pick up the, the spot, but I agree, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to include. Uh, I am uh, basically for that, to include, you know, different, you know, futures contract and anticipate what is going to be in the future, you know, as well as a tool which support the different analytical uh, pr uh, analysis and analytical procedures made on the investor side. So I fully agree with you. Thank you. So now the last presentation, uh, the speaker will be Jose Manuel Camacho from ICMAT. Hi everyone, I'm Jose Manuel Camacho. I will be presenting uh, comp computational adversarial risk analysis for general security games. And that is a joint work with my colleagues, uh, Professor Nabeiro, and my PhD supervisor, Professor Rios Insua from ISEMAT. Yeah, so. Um, we were working with uh, security games that are a way to model uh, scenarios as uh, strate strategic and operational defense or homeland security problems. And in these scenarios, risks are increased by other agents. Uh, and one of the main setbacks uh, when dealing with security games that they, people usually use uh, game theori theoretical approaches that are limited uh, for this case since uh, you are assuming common knowledge, that is uh, a limitation for security domains. That's why we use uh, another approach that is uh, using adversarial risk analysis that mitigates this uh, common uh, knowledge assumption. And instead of uh, being solving uh, the game uh, like simultaneously, you just uh, do it from the decision maker part. Um, but it has also a very big limitation that is very computational intensive. So we need to develop like new method for that. And that's what we did. Uh, we solve uh, efficiently general, uh, we solve uh, efficiently general security gains uh, th uh, through a arbitrary risk analysis uh, with uh, augmented probability simulation, APS. And uh, we do this uh, first representing the gains with uh, BA and influence diagrams. And I will be introducing the sequence, a sequential case and a simultaneous case of security gains. And from that, we can work with uh, uh, general games. So first of all, uh, I, I will introduce the augmented probability simu uh, simulation. It says that you have to maximize like the the, uh, the decision maker expected utility uh, then if the, the utility of uh, the decision given the outcome that is stochastic uh, is not negative and integrable then you can uh, define an augmented distribution that is proportional to the expected utility and as the marginal uh, of this uh, augmented distribution is uh, proportional to the marginal of the expected uh, of the marginal of the expected utility. Sorry, to the expected utility. Then the decision that maximizes uh, the utility is equal to the mode of the this, uh, the augmented distribution. Uh, and yeah, and this is very important. Using this method, we have a very more efficient method than just using Monte Carlo uh, when you are dealing with big decision sets. Uh, then uh, we represent the gains with this. Uh, 
Uh, these diagrams are, are the Bayesian influence diagrams, the bed, the one that I was saying before, and this, w and they are built like this. So the the square nodes are like uh, represent decision. The circle nodes represent uncertainty, are like a random variable, and then like the hexagons are utilities. In this scenario, uh, we suppose that the attacker will uh, see uh, the decision of the decision maker and uh, then it will react from from it. The colors also uh, represent which part are representing. So then you can discomp and it is also this uh, diagrams are also very useful because uh, you can also discompose them and are the base of uh, our approach. So, I mean, the main comparison is game theory again, adversary risk analysis. So if you have uh, game theory, uh, you know everything. So you can just compute the expected utilities. Then you uh, get the attack that maximizes the attack the expected utility. You get this attack and you use it as a decision maker to compute your uh, best decision. Uh, and then you got a uh, nice equilibrium, but this is complete information and in security domains that really holds. I mean, you don't know how the attacker, uh, how the attacker wants to attack you, what are the intention, what are the utilities. So that's why we uh, include uh, uncertainty and we uh, deal with incomplete information. So now we are solving for the decision maker. And we are uh, enabling uncertainty over the utility of the attacker and the probability of the attacker. <laughs> and to do that, the expected utility will also have the assessment of uh, so this, uh, this, uh, this probability distribution. Uh, that is the assessment of the decision maker that uh, the attacker will, will choose a specific attack given a decision. Uh, and that will, um, the w decision that maximizes uh, that expected utility will de be the best. But then you have a, a big problem that you have to uh, obtain uh, that distribution. So, from to do that, you define uh, two other distributions, like reflecting the the information you have about the potential attacker. It can be like data that you already have, but it can be also the opinion of expert. Um, then from that you can induce a random expected utility distribution. You compute from it the, the best uh, attack, the one that maximizes it, and from this you can uh, compute the distribution you're looking for. How you use APS uh, to compute this? So uh, first, uh, you define um, you define an augmented distribution that is proportional to the uh, random expected utility, and then you know that the marginal will be proportional to the uh, expected utility. As uh, I said before, when this happened, you had that the mode. Uh, of that distribution is uh, will be the optimal decision, and to compute uh, that uh, the augmented distribution, uh, you you can just use uh, metropolitan hasting, but you still need to sample uh, the distribution of the defender uh, of the attack given a decision. So then it comes like the, a little bit more messy part. What you do is uh, you first you sample, uh, sorry, so first you, with the distribution that you have uh, defined before, you sample, like you, you build an augmented uh, distribution. Again, you will have uh, that, the, that marginal is, uh, sorry, that marginal is proportional to the uh, expected utility and the maximum of, uh, and the mode of, uh, of the augmented distribution will be 
the best attack. Then sampling for the uh, distribution that you defined before, you can build like an augmented uh, distribution that is a sample from the augmented uh, you the augmented distribution, and from there you again compute the mode uh, to get the, that distribution. So what we did is like also like to make a little experiment. Like okay, we all define this, but what are the differences of the approach? Uh, when we put it like in a real case, uh, what will happen? So uh, we so we consider this a scenario that is uh, you have a organization and you have to decide we, uh, which cybersecurity proto protocol to use. So you have like different levels of uh, intensities from uh, 0 to 10, uh, sorry, 0 to 9. So uh, it's uh, pro so if you increase the level, the probability of success of an attack uh, will be uh, lower, but also it will be the, uh, the cost of the protocol. But uh, so for example, and you also have to consider that if an attack is successful, you lose your whole investment. And in this case, we consider that the whole investment is seven million. So uh, yeah, I think it's better that I just do it with the, f uh, with the fingers. So these are like the cost when the attack is not successful. So the outcome is zero. So you are like with an increasing cost. When that one attack is successful, you have seven plus the cost of the mitigation of the cybersecurity protocol. So as I was showing before, this is like the probability of success. In game theory, we will know that. So you know perfectly what will happen. So for example, when you are like no having like the very basic uh, protocol, uh, you will have a probability of success of uh, 50%. I mean, you're not protecting your system. Uh, they will go through. But when you are like uh, spending uh, like a lot of money, like you are investing in the higher cyber security protocol, that probability of success is uh, very small. We are considering that the decision maker is an, a risk adverse agent and that the attacker is a uh, risk prone. Like these are the cause of the attacks. Uh, also, when there is success and there is no success, so you know if the attacker doesn't decide to do an attack, maybe because uh, he's not interested, it wasn't, he won't have any cause. But uh, when uh, he decides to do it, when he's successful, uh, you can see like the difference. Uh, it gets uh, one point ninety-seven million in the in the case is successful. So in this case, we have to propose like the distribution of success. So it's a beta with different parameters that are also shown in this table. The expected utility uh, of that distribution corresponds to these same values. And uh, from the coefficient e, we just establish um, a uniform distribution from 0 to 2. So we encode that information that you use for game theory, we encode it with distributions. This distribution can be determined with expert opinion, with data. And that's the whole point that in this case, you're assuming that you know everything. Here, you are giving uncertainty to that information. And that's a big difference because in security, you cannot really assume. Um, yeah, like uh, when we solve both, uh, when we solve both game, uh, we got that, uh, so, that the game theory approach gave us eight, while the adversarial risk analysis gave us nine. It was a little bit more conservative, probably also because of the uncertainty. But we were w quite happy that the, also the resort were quite similar. And yeah, like at the same way, we can also define a sequential gain in which both agents act at the same moment, not as before, that the attacker will know the uh, the defender decision first. And we can use those uh, two uh, templates to build more complex structure, like general gains. And then we will have a methodology to, ta uh, to tackle these uh, diagrams that is uh, decide to which block to deal with 
with, as a quencher or simultaneous, then reduce it with uh, some technique like random R inversion, random chance not removal, and random decision not removal, and then go on searching for the following block to reduce. And with uh, augmented probability simulation, we have the method to do this uh, efficiently in computer. That is something that we didn't have before for big decision sets. Uh, it became unfeasible. Uh, so yeah, to conclude, um, so we extended uh, the general security gains with uh, augmented probability simulation. We do it like from basic templates and up to a general case. Uh, and I would like to say that uh, this should be relevant for adversarial machine learning. That is uh, when uh, the artificial intelligence model has been attacked. Uh, and because this can be modeled as security gains. And the very important thing is we are dealing uh, with uncertainty, we are not having common knowledge assumption. And because of that, it is important to have like this method that are scalable and efficient. And I will also, uh, like still a few seconds of your time, I will also like to promote that we are organizing in at ISEMAT with the Royal Academy, Spanish Royal Academy of Science and event, uh, gains and decision in recent reliability, the seventh uh, edition. Uh, more information will be coming out soon. If you have any questions, you can contact me. And yeah, that was all. Thank you. <laughs> questions, comments? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. So one question into the blue. Insurance, uh, cyber insurances are very hard to price. Yeah. So maybe your theory could help to find a price? What do you think? Would that be an application? Mm, I mean, we have no work on that, but I probably I think so, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So let's thank again all the presenters in the session. And now it's time for lunch, so that's it.